And I'm going to call this meeting of the Planning Commission to order. We have uh, four members here. Um, first item is uh, to establish the quorum, which we've done. So the next item is the uh, election of uh, chair and vice chair. So would anyone like to make a nomination for chairman? I'd move to nominate Travis Stribling for chairman. Okay, we have a motion and a second to allow me to continue as chairman. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 4-0. All right, election of a vice chair. I nominate Luke as the vice chair. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to appoint Luke Urich as our vice chairman. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Four zero. Uh, consent agenda. The commission may request for a consent agenda item to be moved to the regular agenda for presentation and public comment. Otherwise, the consent agenda will be considered in one vote. All items on the consent agenda have been recommended for approval by staff with no opposition received to date. Since some items on the consent agenda may require public, a public hearing, the commission will accept public comment on any item on the consent agenda in one public hearing. Uh, so, consideration, we have the minutes, uh, two final plats, and a preliminary plat. I'd like to pull the preliminary plat of Crosswinds subdivision. Um, anyone else want to? Make any other changes to the consent agenda? All right, so we're going to open it up for public, public comment on the consent agenda. Anyone wishing to speak, please come forward, state your name and address or single member district. All right, I'm going to close public comment. Um, you want to take a motion to approve everything but crosswinds? Move to approve. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda except for item D. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 4-0. So the first item is preliminary plat of Crosswind Subdivision, a request for approval of a preliminary plat for Crosswind Subdivision, generally located northeast of the intersection of Montague Avenue and Vec Street extension being 30.53 acres. This is uh, Zach Rainbow Planning and Development Services. As you said, it's a preliminary plat of the Crosswinds subdivision. Uh, currently, um, there is a rezoning and a comprehensive plan amendment, uh, item number three on the rezoning portion under two, um, to address those. Um, they want to keep the large tract you see there just south of the freeway as commercial to keep their options open for future development. And in the southern lots that you see there that are, are approximately 50 by 100, um, they want to do a mix, uh, which will be um, brought before you uh, again with the upcoming rezoning um, of residential uses. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes. So the, the replats on the consent agenda, but there's rezoning that's uh, conditional for this. So... Do we need to hear the rezoning first before we approve this preliminary plat? Yeah, we, we have um, typically preliminary plats are often done well ahead of development. Okay. And so it's not uncommon for a preliminary plat to anticipate future zoning that's not in place yet. Okay. Uh, and so uh, those are always approved. Uh, a condition should be that it, the rezoning does take place at some point, but oftentimes preliminary plats are for much larger areas that develop in phases. Okay. And so the zoning comes in phases as the development happens. So um, that's, it's acceptable for the preliminary plat for sure to be. Is the rezoning, uh, did you say the rezoning was going is on the agenda? Correct. Um, number two, C. Uh, it's labeled as uh, Z22-27 and CP2208. Okay. 
Houston Heart Frontage Road. Yes, sir. Okay. You you could I mean since they're both on the same agenda you could take that item and wait to approve this. Uh, obviously, if the zoning were to fail for some reason. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it makes sense to review the zoning first since it. But again, it's not unusual to have a preliminary plat well before a rezoning case comes to you. I understand. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, if I may. Yes, um, please. This was something we, we were actually going to bring up with you at, at one of the, this, either this meeting or a future meeting. Um, we were debating on uh, putting these three together, the preliminary plat, um, the comprehensive plan amendment, and the rezoning. Um, is that something you'd want to see, or I do you like them I think that makes a lot of sense. Out? If we're talking about one case and we have we have a lot of business on one one plat, one one tract of land like that, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to see it all at once. Okay. Um, so why don't we do that? Okay. I'll just, uh, I'm going to skip around a little bit so we can get this one out of the way. So you said... Uh, item C on rezonings and comprehensive plan amendments. The City Council has final authority for approval of rezonings and amendments to the comprehensive plan. Z22-27 and CP22-08, 2102 to 2298, Houston Heart Frontage Road, SMD4. Uh, CP2208, a request for approval of a, excuse me, to amend the comprehensive plan changing the future land use plan map from commercial to transitional to neighborhood and Z22-27, a request for approval of a rezoning from the single family residential RS1 and general commercial zoning districts to a planned development zoning district being approximately 1.5 acres located northeast of the intersection of Montague Avenue and Vec Street Extension. <clears throat> Does that get all of the cases that are part of this tract? Yes. Okay. Okay. And as you indicated um, all along, this is a request for both a uh, comprehensive plan amendment and a zone change. And so let's take the comprehensive plan amendment first. They have uh, this entire area is zoned commercial and it's a actually commercial below their property. But in looking at the general uses on both sides, those have been more residential in nature or general commercial at the very top. And so the applicant has wanted to keep that top area uh, as commercial, but rezone this to a neighborhood, if you will. It's Right now, it's commercial and transitional. They would like to, on the comprehensive plan, have it become neighborhood. And then looking at the zone change, what they're proposing is a mix of RS3 with an underlying single family uh, lots, some twin home possible or townhouse residential possible. Um, and they're proposing a 15 foot front yard setback and a 25 foot uh, where the entry garage is. So if it's a front entry garage, it would be set back so you would not have that kind of bullnose approach. Okay. Um, and this map shows you the top part that will remain the general commercial and then, then that center part that will be the RS3 with the underlying. And that area will actually be 15.32 acres. This is in SMD4, Lucy Gonzalez's area, and the Paul Ann neighborhood. We sent out 18 notification letters to surrounding property owners. I got a number of calls, but no one really in either support or opposition to the idea. The Most of the people we talked to or I talked to um, thought it was an interesting idea, and they liked the idea that it was going uh, residential. The, uh, the the tract that's forty one, four twenty one. Yes. In red. Is yes. that part of this? Yes, that is the part that is being rezoned and leaving the commercial along 
Okay, so on this, uh, on one of these slides here, it shows that this right. one, yeah, that would that that would do it. So that that little flag is transitional. Yes, that little and end so, of that is transitional. So that's going to go to to the um, RS three, um, just as that. Uh, Commer general commercial bottom part is going to RS3. It's not being zoned as transitional, it's being no. zoned as RS3. RS3, yes. Transitional is the comprehensive plan amendment for that area. Okay. Well, I'm sorry for the confusion. Didn't understand that. Um, I was going to ask about what's allowed in transitional. So. <laughs> <laughs> Transition from one to the other. Got it. Generally, it's going from residential to commercial. In this case, it's going in the opposite direction. Okay. Um, does anyone else have questions for the staff? Or this is, as you can see, the yeah. property is undeveloped, and in looking at it, it makes sense. Uh, staff believes the proposal is uh, actually consistent with the comprehensive plan when we, when we look at the change in the comprehensive plan from general commercial to neighborhood in that area that's wanting rezoning. Uh, we believe the proposed zoning and the change of the comprehensive plan is a good move forward and it does meet the needs of the surrounding property owner, owners in the direction that everything is, seems to be moving in that area with residential backing up to a, a line of commercial. Yep. Um, this opens the door to that, as I said, that area not being impacted on such a large commercial, but opening the possibilities for other development. And we've had a couple of calls from adjoining property owners that uh, were wanting to look at doing the same kind of thing for okay. their property. Um, we believe that the commercial will provide support to the residential area, uh, ser both services and possibly jobs in that area, so it does make sense. And we believe the existing development patterns are well established and that these smaller lots in this area will make sense for how they're proposing the layout on that uh, preliminary subdivision. Okay. So staff is recommending approval of the comprehensive plan and approval of the rezoning for the Z2227. Uh, okay. Uh, does anyone have questions for the staff? Um, all right. I'm going to open it up for public comment. <clears throat> I'm the manager of key accounts uh, with Concho Valley Electric. We own the property um, that is 52686 um, in the top right corner there. Um, yes. I, I really think the issue is resolved. We did mail, email our opposition to this just because the way the letter read, we thought that it was including our property as changing from uh, commercial to residential, but um, I believe I talked with Sherry, yeah. um, and I, I just want to make sure that it was. Yeah, clear I was going to say, let's confirm your 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 lot is zoned commercial. Yes, is that yes, correct? Yes, and yes, that, and it will stay. And it's commercial. not part of this right. case right. for discussion. Yeah, just the way the letter read, it said the subject area was bounded by the that that blue line, and we were like, no, you're on the line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, that was really the only reason for our opposition, and I just wanted to make sure I came to make that aware so okay thank you mm -hmm. good morning russell with skg engineering single member district four for this one and you bring up a good point uh travis about which should come first the approvals you know because because us as, as a developer for the developer if we don't get a preliminary plat approved we don't want the zone change and so they kind of all tie together. Yeah. And, and so we, in reality, we'd like to have the preliminary plat approved conditionally to the zone change. And because if the preliminary plat doesn't get approved, 
we don't want that zoning on this property. Yeah, and I, I understand the, the, the conflict. Uh, I, from, from, my, from my viewpoint, where I'm sitting, uh, if, we're, if we have to change the zoning to approve a, a preliminary plat, we need to at least discuss it. I don't think it needs to be on the consent agenda. Sure, fair, fair so, uh, that's I didn't I didn't even realize until we kind of started diving into this that these cases were related, um, and so it was kind of an un unintended consequence. But um, I, it, it, is there is there an objection to presenting the rezoning and the preliminary plat? No, together? this is a, this is a great way to do it. I, I'm, this works great for us. That way, we, okay. it's all on one discussion. But I, I think our our ask would be to have to hear the preliminary plat first. Because if it goes down, we want to come up and withdraw then our request for the zone change. Okay. Uh, I understand that. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so, yeah, but hearing them all together, great, good big picture kind of deal. And, and our idea will be to bring a, a final plat next meeting for a portion of the preliminary plat. Okay. And so, what, but we'd be happy to answer any questions that you would have. You guys have any questions for Russell? Okay. Thank, Thank you, very you much. Mr. Gully. All right, anyone else wish to speak on this case? All right, I'm gonna close public comment. So we have three, three items here that relate to this case. One is the preliminary plat, which I think is in my hands here, yes. And then a change to the comprehensive plan and the zoning case, is that correct? So, you want to take a motion on the preliminary plat first? Yeah. Okay. Anyone wish to make a motion? Move to approve as presented. Second. All right, so we have a motion and a second to approve the preliminary plat as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Four zero. Okay, now the rezoning and the change to the comprehensive plan. Does it matter which order we do there? Okay. Move to, presume, uh, move to approve as presented. Second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to approve uh, the changes to the comprehensive plan and the rezoning for this, uh, for this case. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That's four zero. All right. Uh, subdivision plats under the regular agenda the Planning Commission has final authority for approval appeals may be directed to the City Council uh, final plat 22-24 McCrory acres final plat SMD 2 the request for approval of the final plat of McCrory acres being 0.973 acres located at 290 West 37th Street in a variance from section 103A1 of the Land Development and Subdivision Ordinance to allow an existing 30 foot, 30 foot pavement width in lieu of the required 64 feet for a proposed arterial road. It's a big change. The, this plot should look very familiar to you. In October, it came before you to rezone it from the R&E to um, an RS1 staff did not support that at the time and the Planning Commission did not vote to rezone it. They then suggested that they go to the ZBA and ask for a variance on the lot sizes for those two lots because neither one of those meet the one acre minimum in the R and E zone. Each of those is just a right at a half acre. And so we did take it to ZBA. ZBA approved the variance. And so it is back to you um, for the plotting for those two pieces of property. I placed beside you a larger version so that you can see this because I know it's difficult to see. Um, in requesting their uh, they have a 10-foot dedication with a 30-foot variance request on Ogden Street. 
The reason behind wanting to keep Ogden as it is, is we've had there's pretty much development along Ogden. It's all, all single family homes, but all of those homes are very close to the front property line. Um, this is, as the comment was made, a uh, minor arterial for the future thoroughfare area. And yet there are two very distinct kind of 90 degree turns or 45 degree turns in that small piece of property as it comes down and connects over. The applicant and their representative asked if we could take another look at whether or not that was a good place to place that um, minor arterial thoroughfare and staff did agree that we would take a look at that and if we thought another layout would make more sense that we would bring that forward. We did ask that the applicant put on their plat map a, they've got the 10 foot dedication for Ogden which they need to do and then they have a 20 foot no build zone which is right next to it, that's the dashed line and then there would be a 25 foot uh, setback from that line if in fact the arterial stays, so the minor arterial stays. And so that does show on the plat and will stay there unless uh, staff brings back a change in the thoroughfare plan. And so with that, staff is recommending approval of the a variance request on Ogden uh, to go with the 30 foot paving width. It meets the needs of the all of the single family homeowners in that area and a couple of variances have been granted on Ogden in the past and since the applicant provided the no build zone we know that if we go in the future we will not have to buy that piece of property or and it does not affect it goes right up to the existing home but does not affect the home so we are recommending approval of both. Okay. Can we talk about it's page 22 of 74 on the uh, what's uploaded to the website? But it's, it looks like it's it's the future minor arterial line. Yes. Let me get back to it. <clears throat> is that as it exists today, or is this? That's a future. That is that the proposal. A proposal for the future, yes. So we're proposing to draw, to take an arterial street through the middle of a two buildings? But yes, but that's already <coughs> on the thoroughfare plan today, so that's not a change. Okay, that's, that's what I was asking. And so that's why uh, they've asked to reconsider that for a number of reasons, yeah. that being yeah. one. Uh, but technically today, that's on the thoroughfare plan, so they're obligated to address it in this plat okay um, which is the reason for the variance we're going to take another look at that for this and the other reasons yes yes but that's yeah. not on today's agenda yeah. that'll be a future item okay uh is there septic on on this lot or is it tied to, is there no it has water sewer? and sewer is in the street in 37th perfect okay so we don't have a a potential septic tank issue with no, these we smaller don't. lots. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <clears throat> um, so, can you could you please explain the variance that's being requested? They are requesting instead of having to improve what would be needed for their half of that future arterial. So we have a 30 foot road and the arterial width is 64. Would be 64, right. So there's there uh, have, 17 there feet they, yeah. they'd have to pave right. and they per are, the subdivision ordinance. Right. And they are dedicating the 30 foot, the additional 30 foot that they need to on their land for a local street. But they're asking to stay with the 30 foot pave, existing pavement width. Okay. Understand. Do you guys have any other questions for the staff? All right, we're gonna go to the recommendation slide though. I'm sorry. The slide of staff oh. recommendations, please. Thank you. Whoops. <laughs> there. 
you. Okay, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Does anyone wish to speak on this case? All right, I'm going to close public comment. Um, <clears throat> Anyone's welcome to share their thoughts or make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve as uh, presented. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 4 0. <clears throat> Rezonings and comprehensive plan amendments. Uh, we've already read in item C. So we're going to jump back to item A, Z22-25, Shriners Point. Hey, Travis, we, we, we've just lost our quorum for a moment, and so oh, yeah. we may need to wait. Uh. <laughs> she got up. I didn't realize it. We're going to take a short break. Um, so we're on... Um, Rezonings and Comprehensive Plan Amendments, Item A, Z22-25, Shriners Point, SMD1. A request for approval of a rezoning from the high-rise multifamily RM2 zoning district to the single-family RS1 zoning district being approximately 14.062 acres, generally located southeast of the intersection of East 40th Street and Blum Street. Um. La at the last meeting in December, you did approve the preliminary plat, and I've included this on there. But just to remind you, this is the piece of property that in 2019 was revo rezoned from <coughs> excuse me, RS1 to RM2, a high-rise multifamily. Um, and that was not looked upon favorably by the surrounding property owners. Um, so they were very happy to hear that, that when the preliminary plat was approved, it was going back to single family. This is the last step in that. Um, you already approved the final plat today. And so this is, as I said, the last step. This is in District 2, Mr. Thompson's district, the Lakeview neighborhood. And staff is recommending to the rezoning to single family. We believe it's compatible with the area. Uh, we believe it's compatible with the future um, plan for neighborhood. Um, and it is consistent with what you have already approved in the past. And so with that, staff is recommending approval to the RS1. OK. Thank you, Sherry. Anyone have questions for the staff? All right, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Good morning. Good morning. My name's Clay Hubbard. I live at uh, 3721 Armstrong, District 2, Tom Thompson. And uh, uh, Mr. Stribling, I think you might be remember when this came up and the, the uh, neighborhood kind of we all organized and and signed a petition against uh, uh, an apartment complex in our neighborhood. Yes, sir. So uh, anyway, uh, what I've talked to recently among the neighborhood, I will, I will tell you that everyone I've talked to is very much in favor of reverting this back to a single-family residential district, no apartments. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to speak on this case? All right, I'm going to close public comment and take a motion. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 4-0. All right. Next item is Z26-26 and CP2207. 3, 5, and 9, West Avenue J, SMD3. Uh, item 1, CP2207, a request for approval of an amendment to the comprehensive plan changing certain lands from the commercial to the neighborhood future land use and Z22-26, a request for approval of a rezoning from the general commercial heavy commercial zoning district to the single family residential zoning district, both being 0.743 acres located at 35 and 9 West Avenue J. Okay. Zach Rainbow Plain. 
sorry, Zach Rainbow Planning and Development Services. Uh, as you said, this is a request for a comprehensive plan amendment and a rezoning request. Uh, you'll be familiar with these three lots. They received a conditional use uh, from the con uh, Planning and Zoning Commission uh, at your December meeting uh, in order to begin construction of single family homes. Um, they have begun. This is just to finalize uh, and bring it all together and wrap it up um, in order to make it um, RS1 single family. Uh, we did send out a notification. Uh, did receive two in opposition. No comments were sent back uh, and none in favor. Um, again, you did approve it um, based on the fact that it's compatible with the area. It is existing uh, in an existing Fort Concho neighborhood surrounded by multiple um, types of residential uses and churches. Previous churches, again, a conditional use for this construction of the single family homes was approved uh, by this commission at your December meeting. Um, just some pictures of the work that has begun uh, along the street. Staff is recommending approval um, from commercial to a neighborhood future land use. This provides a good transition zone, uh, provides an area uh, of town uh, that needed infill and multiple uh, types of residential uses. Um, as you can see here, uh, th these lots have remained vacant since at least 2008. It does give uh, redevelopment uh, in an area that uh, needs some redevelopment uh, and some infill uh, type developments. So staff is recommending approval. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anyone have questions for the staff? All right. Thank you, Zach. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to open it up for public comment. Good morning. Adrian Balderas representing the Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we're just following through basically with what we got approved last month, so hopefully we can get this finalized. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak on this case? All right. I'm going to close public comment and take a motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve as presented by the staff. Uh, that's both the change to the comprehensive plan and the rezoning. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 4 0. All right, we're going to jump to item D. Z22-29, 1201 Coberland Street, Single Member District 3. Request for approval of a rezoning from the RS1 zoning district to two-family RS2 zoning district being 0.161 acres located at 1201 Coberland Street. Okay. Zach Rainbow Planning Development Services. As you said, this is a request uh, to rezone from uh, single-family residential to two-family residential. Uh, in District 3, Harry Thomas, uh, the Fort Concho neighborhood. Um, here's a picture of the map. As you can see, it's almost surrounded completely by RS1 zoning. Um, there is uh, RS2 uh, to the southwest there, and a large portion of RS2 type neighborhood uh, just one block further to the west. Um, this, so this would not be out of line and be in character with the neighborhood. This is an existing or a previously existing church. The structure still exists. Um, the plan is to uh, convert it into a duplex. Um, we sent out a notification. Did receive uh, none in favor or in opposition. Um, here is the church that exists, the building. Um, here's the plans for the duplex. Some pictures of the existing church uh, in the surrounding area. Um, it was reviewed pursuant to the land development code, uh, the zoning ordinance, and the comprehensive plan, um, which is neighborhood. Uh, the proposed two-family zoning is in line. 
uh, with the comp plan and the ordinance and the criteria to mention. Um, staff does not feel it has any adverse effects to the existing neighborhood and uses that uh, predate this. Um, it also does provide an opportunity for infill development and a mixed use of housing um, for this area. And with that, be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Zach, could you go back to the photographs? Yep. This one? Uh, maybe. I, I'm, this... I'm trying to reconcile this, uh, this floor plan with the pictures of the structure. So, let me... Are there... Is there a... I mean, obviously, there's going to be an entrance off of Coberlin. Um, is there a secondary entrance for the second unit on the side street? Okay. We'll let them come up here in just a second. It was a little difficult to get, to get pictures. Uh, one of the neighbors was very interested in the property, so I was trying to get pictures. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for public comment. Okay. I'm Lauren. I'm the representative for this one. Um, I'm pulling up more pictures for you now on that. But there is another entrance. So you have your front entrance and then this side street right there, there is another entrance and there's parking in the back for at least four parking spots. Okay. Let's see. You don't have to pull the pictures okay, up. Okay, you don't need to see. No, ma'am. Yeah. I was, I was just curious about how, how the egress was going to look. Mm -hmm. And with it being on the corner, I think having entrances on different streets is good. You said there was parking in the back? Yes. So there is, the church originally had parking back there. It's bleachy, but it's enough for four parking spots. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Hey. All right. Does anyone else wish to speak on this case? All right. I'm going to close public comment. Anyone have questions or want to make a motion? Staff approval. Or recommendations, I'm sorry. Make a motion to approve as presented. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve as presented by the staff. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Four zero. Conditional uses. Uh, CU 22-31, 2602 Nasworthy Drive, SMD 5. The request for approval of a conditional use to allow a renewal of a short-term rental, STR, in the Single Family Residential Zoning District located at 2602 Nasworthy Drive. Good morning, Ray Lineberry Planner. Um, this is a short-term rental, um, and it is in Karen Hesse Smith, District 5, ASU College Hills area. It is RS1. Um, pictures of the front of the house and the um, street and showing that they do have two parking spots. Um, we did mail out 18 notices and received two in favor and four opposed. Um, most of the opposition, it is a, a tight knit street that they, they do not want anybody they don't know around them. Okay. Um, and they, they did mention that they have a petition going around the neighborhood against this. <laughs> um, that, was, that was their only reasoning. Is they didn't want somebody they didn't know. Okay. Um, the impacts will be minimized. There, it is consistent with the zoning ordinance. There is not an active one within 500 feet. Um, it is RS1 zoning. Um, there's no foreseen adverse effects on the environment. The short-term rental will provide more rentals within the ASU College Hills area, um, and it does not impact the home at all. So staff is recommending approval with the um, three conditions that they maintain the off-street parking, they get a certificate of occupancy from permits and inspections, and they obtain an annual fire inspection. And the note is that they are required a one-year renewal 
Um, and then after the one year renewal, it'll be every two years and they do have to provide um, proof that they are paying the hotel tax. Is this, a renewal? this one is not. The oh, agenda was incorrect. The okay. next one is the renewal. Oh, this is a new. Correct. This, this is one new. is a new one. Okay. I'm sorry. The agenda was incorrect. The next one is a renewal. Um, okay. Wow, that completely changes my, my, my mindset here. So Sorry. It is not a renewal. It is not. Uh, okay. So anyone have questions for the staff? Do you have any written objection from the folks that I, I are do in that have area? Um, three that are the the bottom of the letter. They didn't none of them wrote a reason. But they did send in a that objection. they are opposed. Okay. Uh, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Anyone wish to speak on this case, please come forward, state your name and address or single member district. I'm going to close public comment. Um, it's a little concerning to see uh, that much objection in the immediate area. Um, but there also doesn't appear to be any compelling special circumstance or reason to. With that being so close to the university, I'm sure that somewhere on that block there probably are some longer term rentals, in my opinion. So I, I'll make a motion to approve as presented. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 4 0. Uh, CU 22 32 224 West Avenue B, SMD 3. Request for approval of conditional use to allow short term rental in the two family residential zoning district located at 224 West Avenue B. <coughs> this one is the renewal. Um, so, renewal. they are requesting a renewal on their short term rental. It is a house and then they have built an apartment in the back that will also be a short-term rental. So this renewal includes both. Um, okay. It is RS2 zoning, District 3, Harry Thompson, um, Fort Con or Harry Thomas, sorry, and Fort Concho neighborhood. Um, a few pictures of the front of the house. Um, he did put up sidewalks and if you could see he's currently paving the drive to the back and in the very back, which I obviously couldn't get a picture since it's in his property, there is a concrete pad for parking for both places. Okay. Um, see, this is the layout. If you see at the, if I remember how to, yep, up here is the existing slab for parking. And then this will be the apartment and then the house for both our short term rental. Okay. Um, we sent out 20 notices. We didn't receive any either in favor or opposed. Um, again, the impacts are minimized. Um, there are no, sh no short-term rentals active within 500 feet. Um, it is RS2 zoning, so it allows for both dwellings. Um, there, we do not foresee any effect on the natural environment. It is needed in the Fort Concho area. There's not very many short-term rentals there. Um, and it, it does go along with the development patterns. So staff is recommending approval. Um, as long as they maintain the off-street parking, they obtain a certificate of occupancy for both dwellings and then get the annual fire inspection. Um, and then this one, they will be required to renew every two years instead of every year. Is this considered a, a renewal? Or it was renewal on the front one. And right, because staff on staff back. discussed it, and we feel the conditional use is on the property, not on the structure. A the structure. structure. So it is a, a renewal since they did have it already. Yeah, it's kind okay. of gray area. Okay. Yeah, that, that's how staff saw it. So one of the conditions of uh, renewals is a review of police reports, uh, code compliance, 
has all of that been done? Or yep. Are they in good standing? They are in good standing. Uh, They've paid their taxes? Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyone I'll else have questions? Go question? back to Trinidad's question. Um, it, it is a renewal, as Ray mentioned, um, to the extent that it causes any concerns, and, and it doesn't for staff, but you could place additional conditions, um, you know, for let's say this was a four unit building and they wanted short terminals in all four units, you could say, well, no more than two units. Or in this case, you could say the main house, but not the accessory. Uh, again, we don't see any problems with it, but uh, as a conditional use, you are able to place conditions uh, if there are some concerning aspects to a particular request. I'm good with it since I have, it's been uh, no activity of the negative kind of in any manner. No. Okay. I'll second that approval. I think I've got to open it up for public comment, or have I? <laughs> when I open it up for public comment, anyone wish to speak on this case? All right, I'm going to close public comment and take a motion. I make a motion to approve as presented. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 4-0. Uh, CU 22-34, 128 Morris Avenue, SMD3, a request for approval of a conditional use to allow a short-term rental in the single-family residential zoning district located at 128 Morris Avenue. Okay, this is the last short-term rental for this meeting. <laughs> um, it is a brand new request for conditional use. It is in RS1 zoning. It is in District 3, Harry Thomas, the Glenmore neighborhood. Um, pictures of the front of the house and um, the street. The parking is gravel, so they will have to pave um, the parking, the driveway. We mailed out 19 notices, one in favor, and we actually received one in opposition. They were here earlier. Um, they couldn't stay. So the reason that they are opposing is because, let's see, hold on. Um, okay. So the, this 20941 is the, the couple that is opposing because this house right next door um, somebody is living back there and there's complaints and noise complaints, police reports. Um, so they're worried that bringing in a short-term rental would not be good for the area since they are having so many issues with that house. Um, that okay. is the reason they are in opposition. Um, otherwise, we didn't receive any other in opposition. Um, impacts are minimized. It is consistent. There is not another active one within 500 feet. Um, it is in RS1 zoning. Uh, there's no foreseen adverse effects on the environment. Um, there is a need for short-term rental in the Glenmore area, and it does follow development patterns. So we are recommending approval um, with the conditions that they do pave and then maintain the parking, um, obtain a certificate of occupancy, and obtain a annual fire inspection and again the note is they will be required to come back in a year and then every two years after that okay it does not it's just a, but that the is neighbor. they're they're just worried with that being in the neighborhood okay, okay. anyone else have questions for the staff all right i'm going to open it up for public comment if you wish to speak on this case, please come forward. All right, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, I certainly understand someone's concerns about a vacant structure uh, being occupied, but um, because it's not directly related to this case, and I kind of feel like there's a, a benefit to having improvements made on this other side, they may, they may step in to, to help clean up the the problem. So, anyone wish to make a motion? Motion to approve is presented. Second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to approve as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 4 0. Uh, the next item is a discussion of uh, oh, possible park land 
Declaration or Dedication Ordinance. Discussion on a possible park land dedication ordinance. And I'll, I'll be stepping you through this one. Um, as it says there, at a couple of recent council meetings, the city council uh, was, was looking at some rezonings and, and proposed new developments. And the question came up, why, why is there no park land being uh, provided uh, as part of those developments? And so uh, they directed staff to uh, start to research a parkland dedication ordinance, which is something many cities have. Uh, basically, uh, as it says there, to ensure that new neighborhoods have sufficient parkland uh, and the way that works in other cities that have that requirement, uh, it would it's basically a provision in the subdivision ordinance that uh, new developments uh, would have to set aside parkland, and I'll get into the details of that. Um, uh, usually two elements are included within that. One is the parkland dedication itself, so a developer would be responsible for setting aside land for a park. Um, now, we have lots of fairly small developments, and so it, it doesn't always make sense. As you'll see in the examples I'm going to give, um, uh, usually it's something like an acre of park for every roughly 100 homes. Um, and so if you're not having a development that's that large of 100 homes, um, you know, you don't want to get like a tenth of an acre. And so uh, the option in other cities' ordinances is the, the fee in lieu of dedication uh, so basically, if you're developing a 10-lot subdivision, you would just pay a fee uh, roughly equivalent to your share of a future parkland that would go into a fund that would be used to purchase a park uh, parkland in that general vicinity at some point in the future. Basically, as developments happen one by one, you build up a fund that the, you then can go buy parkland uh, once enough development has occurred. Uh, the second piece is actually development of the park. Um, uh, as some of these other cities' ordinances require a developer to actually not only dedicate the land for a park, but build the park, whether that be tennis courts or playgrounds or uh, other types of amenities that are typically in a neighborhood park. Uh, and again, this would also have an option for a park development fee uh, where uh, if the developer is not dedicating land or they choose to just pass it on to the city's uh, uh, parks Department to build the park, uh, they would just pay into a fund uh, to build amenities within the parks. And so those two funds, parkland dedication and the park development fee, would be kept completely separate uh, under the state law that allows this. Uh, you can't use park acquisition money to build in parks, and likewise, you can't use park development funds to buy land for parks. Those have to be two separate, uh, separate things. I just have a couple of examples. We've been looking at a few cities, but these are kind of representative. Uh, College Station, for example, they require one acre of parkland for every 102 homes or apartments. Uh, alternatively, if, there, if you do the fee in lieu, then the developer would pay $200 per dwelling unit uh, for parkland. And then the park development fee on top of that uh, in College Station is $764 per dwelling unit. Uh, Fredericksburg is very similar. In fact, most cities that have these ordinances, they're very similar uh, in terms of the way they're set up. It uh, really only differs in the number of acres per dwelling unit and the dollar amounts that are charged for the fees in lieu. Uh, Fredericksburg is one acre per 133 dwelling units uh, or a $314 per dwelling unit for a park land acquisition and $300 for park development. Uh, again, we don't have an ordinance for you today. Um, we've just begun to research this, but uh, the thinking was let's bring it to you all for discussion to get uh, any questions, um, direction you might have. Um, you think it's a horrible idea. We shouldn't waste staff time doing it. You know, we just want to... Um, to kind of get a feel for what you're thinking. Uh, this will also be going to the Parks Board for their discussion and input. Uh, so really, uh, the main purpose of today is just to present the idea and see if you all have questions, suggestions, how to move forward, that sort of thing. I do have a question. Um, on a lot of developments, um, a lot of builders are required um, to allocate X amount of lots for um, drainage purposes, whether it's a retention pond or um, kind of a leach area. Are, so the developer's already losing a considerable amount of revenue um, per lot cost or buildable 
um, land. So are the parks allowed to kind of coincide in that specific area so they're not double losing on that, land? That, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, most most cities allow for lands like that to be included as parkland. Okay. Uh, they usually have some stipulations. Uh, often it can't be more than a certain percentage of the parkland. Uh, it has to be usable as parkland. And so, um, you know, if it's a retention pond that's always full of water, uh, then you wouldn't necessarily count that. Sure. Um, uh, although I was, was going to say, seen, although water in a park yeah. is kind of well, nice. I, I, I was actually going to say, I, there, I've seen on. some cities where uh, if, if those detention ponds are created as a water feature, you know, I've yeah. seen mm -hmm. one with a fountain in it, and it, yes. it's actually an amenity as part of the park. Right. Um, but those, those can be spelled out both in the ordinance, but oftentimes um, they may, something like that might require, say, the parks board to accept it as... Okay. Uh, as parkland. Uh, another common requirement is um, limitations on the use of floodplain. Now floodplains can be very good for parks and trails, um, but also some cities that haven't had provisions limiting it um, will see developers just sort of, they want to give a detention pond and some floodplain area they can't develop anyway, but it's not really usable for parks. And so um, uh, one common requirement is that it have street frontage, for example, so that it's accessible uh, mm -hmm. to the public. It can't be, you know, floodway in the back of a property that no one can access. Uh, okay. On the other hand, I've seen examples where it's it's not as accessible, but there's a trail that, that's right. running through it. And so yeah. um, in the North Dallas area, some of the Plano, Richardson, right. some of those cities, most of their parks are along creekways, yeah. and they have trails built as part of the system. Right. And so... Uh, there's the intent would be to have some flexibility uh, for use of, of those floodplains and drainage detention ponds, um, but at the same time, ensuring that it's usable parkland that people can, you know, kids can go play and that sort of thing. And John, there in College Station, it says 102, uh, and then, uh, or I'm sorry, 200, and then 764. Is that a one time fee? So 964 per dwelling unit? In lieu of yes, just at the. the Basically, at the development stage, sometimes it's collected at the time of platting, or it could be at the time of building permit. Um, but yeah, so for every house they build or apartment, um, uh, every unit, uh, and some cities differentiate. They charge more or less for apartments versus homes, uh, but most cities kind of keep it as a flat rate across the board. So in um, the example shown with 102 units, that's roughly 98,000 or 100,000 that they'd have to dedicate. And all I did was take the 764 plus yes. 200 times 102. So we're asking them to not only build it, but also dedicate roughly 100,000. Well, they have a choice. They, they can set aside some of their land and build a park for their neighborhood, uh, or they can pay the city to do that, basically. They don't have to do both. <clears throat> or they could dedicate the land and not build the park. Correct. But so they, they could dedicate the land, and then in College Station, money. they would only have to pay the 764, not the 200. Yep. Okay. So what about, like, for instance, in Southland, when you've got um, multiple developers, like, that kind of are abutting properties? So, for instance, you've got Sierra Vista that's building off of um, Dominion Ridge, and then you've got West Texas land guys that have a huge development that they've sold off lots to builders. And then you've got um, Tony Jones that would kind of abut to that. How would that work? Like, well, it, there'd be a few different ways. N number one, they could all sort of get together and say, hey, we're, one of us will give this land and we'll all pitch in and, and figure out some sort of common arrangement if they wanted to help plan, you know, a location of a park as an amenity for all of the, the homes they're building. Or they could simply just say, we'll pay the fee and let the city figure out where to buy the land and how to build it. Um, and then is the land then bought at market value, or are you expecting the builders to give you a discount on those lots? No, it, it would be at market value, but again, it's it's kind of a double-edged sword because the fees are typically set based on market value of land. So, right. okay. um, you know, if, if developers, you know, if there's an incentive for them not to overprice it because right. then that gets priced back into what they get charged on Got the front it. end. And uh, I know this is the very beginning of lots of discussions um, and I'm pro park I don't think San Angelo has enough um, but so how how long like for instance the builder dedicates the land to the city how long does the city have to improve that property 
and then I'm assuming they're responsible for taking care of it. Is it does the equipment get changed out every ten years? Like how does that work? For instance, like there's on A and M and um, Avenue N, there was that park there forever that was <laughs> dilapidated, and I think they just tore it all down. You know, and so now it's just bare, ugly land. <laughs> well, and that that got rededicated as um, open space, basically. But there's there's uh, that's actually one of several sites that the city is looking at going okay. back in and and doing parkland improvements to those. Um, well, I think one of your questions was maintenance. Uh, ultimately, it, let's say a developer builds the park, it would be dedicated to the city. From then it's on, the it would be the city's responsibility. Yeah. In terms of replacement of, of uh, okay. playgrounds or whatever, that would just be on the city's normal replacement right. cycle. For you know, It would be and thrown in with all of the other parks right. uh, for that. I think there was another question I didn't answer, but I don't remember. I don't know. I haven't what? slept for a week, so I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a. I think it's a good. I, I. I really like this idea. I don't know how we arrive at prices for land and improvements that are reasonable. reasonable. Do you have yeah. Do you have thoughts on how you're going to? arrive at those numbers uh, we would probably work with our real estate uh, division and uh, probably some local appraisers just to get an idea of what what's land selling for um, and the city would likely look at possibly uh, the way I described it earlier we collect this money and then at some point go out and buy the land um, the city could decide to front load that and we could go out before an area develops and, and buy the land um, and then collect the money to basically pay that back over okay. time. But uh, either way, as part of this, as we move forward, we'll have to do some analysis on average land values and to come up with, you know, if a developer... I mean, I'm assuming that at some point, at, it, if, you, if you adopt an ordinance like this, the prices are going to change and over time. I'm assuming you could go back and revisit... Yeah, it would become part of the city's um, normal fee schedule, and so... Um, you know, that's typically looked at every three years yeah. for an update, and so that would be part of that normal process. Okay. I guess my only concern is just the overall cost, um, you know, that was broken down. The developers assume so much cost um, with infrastructure, et cetera. I mean, right now the cost of concrete's almost tripled, you know, in the last six to eight months. Um, so it's making a lot of development almost unfeasible for uh, developers. Um, either that or they've got to sell those lots at such an unreasonable price that it's, again, pricing um, the structure once built higher than where it should sure. be, you know, in, in the current market and the situation that we're in right now. So that's my only real concern is how that, um, what the um, dollar amount would end up being. I, I love the idea. I just think that we've got to probably have a meeting, I would say, with the HBA um, and get the builders' opinions as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, Throughout and this just process. make sure. Yeah. I mean, because they are the ones that are dedicating it. So. Sure. I think I'm going to open it up for public comment because I feel like there may be some guys that would like to share their thoughts. <laughs> come on, Tony. Good morning. Good morning. Gary Cortez, uh, builder. Mostly I develop a little bit. Uh, I just kind of came up here today to listen to this and some thoughts as John was talking came to my mind. And One of them is uh, we dress it up as parkland, but it's an impact fee on development. The other is you do the requires one acre park land. The money the developer would have to pay in, does that go to their particular development or does it go into a bucket and go off develop off somewhere else 10 miles away? It, it typically, there are some statute, statutory limitations under state law. Uh, typically, it, it, it's sort of vaguely worded, but it has to be for the benefit of that area. And so you couldn't take it from this developer and spend it completely on the other side of town, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be 
you know, right there in your development. But the Southland example is a good one if it's if it's in that general neighborhood. Uh, you know, so it varies by city. Sometimes uh, ordinances will say it has to be spent within you know two miles of where it was collected, or you know, s some sort of limitation like that. Um, so there's a state law there that I didn't like the word vaguely. Well, Brandon was probably cringing as I said that too, but. Um, so will there be criteria of some sort, uh, if there's already a park in that area, uh, a distance from the development? Like for instance, I mean, Gary, and this would, you were gonna be another example that I was gonna use. You're the main developer, obviously, of Paul Ann, so you already have Producers Park that's there, so how would, that would pan out. Uh, that would be something that's definitely a good discussion point for as we yeah. move forward. Or infill. I would take any infill, right? Um, take well, John, I Santa sure. Rita. John, you've been thinking about this a little longer than I have. What is your idea? What is your thoughts on that? Do you have well, any? I think, I mean, my, my recommendation would be to, again, research this more, look at other cities. Uh, I think it would be reasonable to have some exemptions, perhaps for infill, uh, if you're doing a redevelopment uh, of just, you know, you're splitting, you know, one lot into three in an area that's already developed, uh, that could possibly be an exemption. Uh, if you're in a neighborhood that's uh, adjacent to a park or within a few blocks of a park, that might make sense. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, those are the details we haven't really looked in. Um, in just reviewing a few other cities' ordinances, uh, often they do have some exceptions or limitations, uh, and we'll be looking at all those. But those are the kinds of input we'll want throughout this process uh, from you yeah. all uh, as well. I definitely think there needs to be a mile cap on it because, um, again, like if Gary's the main developer um, out in Paul Ann, um, you know, and he's putting up, you know, let's say over the next five years, 100 homes, it um, or whatever it might be, it wouldn't be necessarily fair for him to be feeding all that money into that pool and then have that money go down all the way down Bell Street, and it doesn't affect or assist anyone in the community he's built. So. Now, preliminary plats that are already on file uh, that have proposed park on them, uh, vested rights, I suppose, would enter into that, whether they're... Yes, this would only be applicable to new development that's not already got um, a final plat for sure, but uh, we'd have to do some of the legal research. But um, how, my guess is that if you have an approved preliminary plat, it wouldn't apply either. There's, uh, if it has the, well, I'm just saying in general, if they have a proposed park on there, there's nothing to, on the preliminary plat to, on the books right now to uh, compel them to go ahead and do that park if it's just proposed right on the book yeah I, I mean you may know better than i do no. i'm not aware of any preliminary plats that that show parkland uh, but that that may be incorrect uh, but there's not anything on the ordinance side of things that says if it's on the preliminary plat right now as we speak that uh, when it gets to that point that would uh, say okay mr developer you had it on your preliminary plat five years ago now I put it in <clears throat> That's a good question. I don't have an answer for that today, but that's definitely something throughout this process we can okay. we can make sure we have an answer to. Not, I'm not against parks. Uh, I'm against maintenance and the cost of them. I've always often yeah. wondered uh, in our, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. On your college station deal and their property tax situation from, you know, we had this property tax deal here this year that hit everybody. I guess everybody. But uh, up, and it always goes up. Uh, do they have on their tax a, uh, a separate deal for, and I've always thought with San Angelo needs because it's hard to look it up in the general budget stuff unless you're really into it. Uh, 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 taxation for parks is separate. Here, folks, here's what we're paying for our parks. Here's what it's cost us to keep our parks going. It's, it's kind of opaque, let's put it that way, unless you really get into the nuts and bolts of the city budget, and who does that, you know? I, I mean, there there would be you could look at the line items for parks, the parks budget, yeah. and see how much does the city spend as a whole on yeah, parks. Spend as a whole. Um, I would think San Angelo spends quite a bit. We're pretty well spread. I've got beautiful parks along the river, and uh, you know, get all these grants and everything. I, I like San Angelo's park system. I know the Bluffs doesn't have a park. 
Yeah. And I think that's the concern is that there, we have some areas that are deficient on parks currently. Yeah. Um, and the concern is the, the way we're developing uh, and not acquiring parks in areas as they develop. Uh, that's, we're just exacerbating the problem over time. That's the thought in my mind is it's, it's not, the, it, it, it's not the, the established subdivisions uh, that are, I mean, there's, there's parks all over the city in those areas. It's the, it's the areas that we're expanding. Um, and we've got, I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't think of a subdivision plat that I've looked at since I've served on the planning commission that's had parkland dedicated. And obviously it's not required, but... Um, Usually it's a maintenance item. What's old is new. Developers many years ago used to provide land for parks, churches, schools. Yeah. And, uh, you know, everything gets codified and code. I mean, we come forward with all these other requirements we got to meet. you got to start backing off somewhere. And uh, but years ago, Ted Brown. Yeah. Uh, era. <laughs> which goes back a long way. But... Uh, I'm not that old, but uh, I don't know if the Holloman School out there was dead, was given or not. Um, I don't know, but that's what used to happen. Developers would come in, and part of the deal was we dedicate, we just dedicate. They would dedicate parkland, and some some of the developers would develop it. But over the years, uh, the maintenance of our parks. I imagine it's pretty substantial. I'd like to see a maintenance of what our maintenance cost is versus, say, is College Station a good, that's a pretty big town, of uh, sister cities, say, so Abilene, what they run, I don't know how. Like a per capita? Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I don't either. It's yeah. a good question. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, as far as what the citizens know about what we pay for keeping our parks up, uh, I don't know. I know what's in there, but I've never looked it up. Does anybody know? You know? No. No, but that's a good question as part of this process. We yeah. can look into that and yeah. do some comparisons. And, um, and, and I think a quick, I'm sorry to interrupt, Gary, but a question that really hasn't been answered that, that oftentimes is asked with, with these kind of ordinances is, uh, you know, why doesn't the city just do that on their own? And that's kind of a philosophical question of, um, do we ask all the taxpayers to pitch in and buy new parks as, as areas develop, uh, or should that be the responsibility of the development that's creating a new need for these additional parks? And that's there's really not a right answer to that. Cities do it differently, um, but uh, many cities with tight budgets have gone to pushing that as an obligation under the logic Okay, there these new neighborhoods, new apartments, new yeah, homes. Yeah, there's not a need for are, those are parks until you need. add the rooftops. Right, and so do you ask the developer to pay that cost, pass it on to those homeowners, where they're in effect paying for their new park yeah. that they're going to use, uh, or do you just ask all the citizens to pitch in and do that over time? And uh, again, either answer. Cities do it both ways. It's more of a philosophical question. Kind of what you found over time, if you dedicate land to either a park, school, church, whatever, you know, the, do the housing, does the housing sell faster, better? Does it appreciate more? I mean, do you see value in doing that versus just infill, just houses with no amenities? If I had enough land, I probably, I don't have any problem if it all worked out in lower area, park flood plain or whatever, dedicating or giving the land away, but building it, I'm not a park builder. Uh, I guess I gotta learn. Uh, but, uh, you know, as far, <laughs> another learning curve, but as far as, uh, 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 yeah, you probably hear some people say, I wish there was a park around, see, Paul M. Park was named Paul M. Park back in the 70s, and it took till just recent time. I wasn't always the developer out there. I've only been the developer out there since 2000, development, but uh, uh, there wasn't a park out there. I hear people say, why do they call it Paul M. Park? It's not a park. I did hear that. And uh, so uh, uh, the producer's park went in. And uh, uh, but what I, I think what I'm seeing, uh, and I could be wrong, is schools used to have their playground equipment where we could go. Uh, I took my kid yep. to Holloman's playground equipment when he was young, which in the early 2000s. And now I'm seeing the areas locked off. It's fenced off, yes, fenced sir. Off. That's what I've seen. And uh, so... Uh, 
and for obvious, and we know why, and uh, what's going on, and I hear they're even going to raise the fences up to eight feet. But uh, so I see it, you know, I see both sides there, but I don't know, it has rings like sidewalks to me. <laughs> now, now wait, just to, just to clarify, wait, wait, before you leave, on sidewalks, we got we to gotta have a place for people to walk, I know, and we've I know. agreed that green the roadway areas, green is, areas. is acceptable. Yeah, green areas, green areas, yeah. things like that. I, I agree, I agree. I, I have an easement running through mine, a WTU, large easement. I, it just has walking paths written all, all over it, and it goes right, cuts right through the pollen area from the very old to the very new and uh, so it's a uh, it'll be an easement forever and uh yeah, great but, use you know i just don't have the money or the political clout to get that proved or through and but it has it written all over it i mean it just stares at you and they won't go put sidewalks somewhere else and, oh this weird news don't know you need to look at this falls on their fears but you know you try and that's it there's areas, easements, so you, you, mm -hmm. you know, high-line easements, walking paths and things like that. Generate some little park equipment along the side of it. I don't know. I don't know. It's always a maintenance issue. Who's going to maintain it? And, uh, it's definitely a factor. Yeah, yeah. And some creative, you know, a creative instead of just a rectangular or square. Let's put a bunch of stuff out there and everybody go to it. You could, you know incorporated into a lot of things, a little creativity, I guess you'd say. But uh, floodplains, easements, utility easements, highline easements, things like that. There's, uh, I'm not opposed to it as far as, I'm opposed to cost, to watching unnecessary costs, sure. because this isn't the only thing that's going to come at us in the next year. It'll be something else. Code, either the code books, or no, you know, it's John's job. It's John's job. I mean, you know, I don't care. And uh, but code books, we're 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 dealing with code books right now, and trying to take the excess out of those. And uh, it's tough. Yeah, it is. It's a constant battle. It is. And uh, uh, you know, uh, I think all y'all are good people, but you don't want to see me up here. You know. Thank you for coming. Pretty calm. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for your feedback. Before Rocky gets up here, I did. I remembered your question, Brittany, um, about how long you have to spend it, and there are some limitations on that. And most of these ordinances have provisions that something like if you collect the money, you have to actually spend it on parks within ten years, or it gets refunded back to the developer. Uh, Rocky Jumlin, single member District Six. Yeah, kind of like Gary said, uh, I would just like to see an extensive deal of the parks now as they are what we're spending, uh, the ones that are vacant, you know, where the they took the equipment out because of lack of use. And, yes, sir. Uh, of course, when I was growing up, my children were growing up, my grandchildren started growing up, the elementary schools were the playground. Because yep. everywhere you typically build a subdivision, you build an elementary school. Yes. And then, of course, then whenever that took place, that they all started locking those up, except for, well, they're locked up totally. And so the only people that are there are the kids from eight to three or whatever. So, um, and the schools are getting bigger. Hmm? And the schools are getting bigger. Well, but they're going to close too. So yes, yeah. they are going to get bigger. Yeah. And so that might be something to look at: is the two they're going to close or whatever is that land also? Um, but I think Carl made a point uh, the other day at City Council. Um, he was like, some parks are overused. Well, those parks that seem to be overused are because those are the parks that the parks are taking better care of. And so when you go yeah. to Rattlesnake Park and you're stepping in gopher holes and, <laughs> and, and all that, and the stickers are overwhelming. And so the parks that kind of quit being used were because they were let go. Yeah, they and weren't being maintained. I think if those parks, even where the vacant land is now, were to be actually repurposed and and put new equipment, it's just like when we build a subdivision, we build houses, they will come. Well, yeah. there's no reason you're not going to take an old park on Avenue N and A&M and repurpose it, refurbish it. They're not going to just drive by it and go, oh, look, a new park. They're going to go use it. And so I would like to see that kind of stuff done. Kind of the problem I have with this is, you know, my first – Preliminary plat was like about $1,200. My last preliminary plat was $12,000. So I put a lot of money into it to all of a sudden be say, okay, well, you need to dedicate land 
or you need to pay an assessment per unit yep. and then we're going to build a park somewhere else so you know that's kind of hard to swallow off for my buyers it's like oh well you're paying a thousand a lot for parks because when you ask the public yes they want parks but kind of like sidewalks they don't, they don't want to pay, pay for them. them so thank you thank you Good morning, folks. Uh, Tony Jones, developer and single mis district member, District 6. Never could get that out very quickly. <laughs> um, you know, as this thing comes up and begins to be researched, uh, I think that both planning, council, uh, you folks need to think about the cost that's going to be involved on the front end for this. Yes, sir. Um, it would be interesting to know how much money we spent on sidewalks just since John's been here. I mean, we spent hundreds of thousands. As a city before, or? As a city before a John city. ever got here on sidewalks. And then when John got here, it was renewed and we went through that process. And, you know, so I think that uh, it, it behooves council and all of you that serve the city uh, to kind of try to get a grasp on the cost. Yeah. on the front end of what just the studies are going to cost. I don't think as a developer, I, well, I know as a developer for years, I have, I have bemoaned the fact that putting in a park, uh, I needed parks in my subdivisions. Simply, simply true. Uh, I, I know I've needed parks in my subdivisions. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, Early on, the first 25 years of my development life, there were parks closer to where I was developing, and now we've kind of worked away from all of that, as John's pointed out. I don't think any of us as developers would have a problem uh, commit, committing, when we design 100 lots, committing to the fact that we would pay two, three, four hundred dollars $400 a lot as we put them in to the city, to a slush fund, if you will, for them to do with whatever they want to do with it. Yeah. I, I don't think any of us would have a problem with that. The guys behind me might argue the price point, but, you know, we have to pass it on just in order to do business. But none of us can afford to put in two streets, 20, 40, 60 lots, and go build, you know, a five-acre park. Right. It's 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 not a it's not our business to design those. It's not our business to pay for those completely. I don't believe, and it's not our business, obviously, to maintain them. So, you know, if we need to pay a fee in development for the future development of parks, I don't have any problem with that. I, if I brought John a plat with a hundred acre with a hundred acres on it or a hundred lots either one and he says, okay, well I want this corner for a park. What would make most sense to me is that when I'm purchasing or after I have purchased that land, that the city split the cost of that land with me. Okay? And then we pay the two or three or four hundred dollars, whatever it is per lot, for a slush fund. Um, it's just uh, you know, parks always, parks department always wants more. Uh, they need more, uh, but can can we afford it or not? Is is my question? Yeah, I, and I I think you've made a couple of valid points. Uh, to your point about splitting the cost, if you paid the assessment, uh, you. We would be splitting the cost. You would basically be splitting the Essentially, cost. Essentially, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and the other big point I want to make is I, I think I think people's vision for a park uh, might be a, a, a place that has playground equipment and, and activities, and that may not necessarily be the case for all of the parks mm -hmm. that are built. Uh, having the green space, having an area where folks can go kick a ball in a field or uh, fly a kite or do something that they can't do in their yard uh, is, I think, one of the great benefits of parks. And that's, that's what I feel like we're missing with the subdivision development that we've 
seen early in the on, last five early, years. And early on, just for an example, early on in our negotiations with John, I said, John, why don't you let us pay into a slush fund per lot and let's build your sidewalks down the Red Arroyo? Yeah. From west to east, let us do that. Let us contribute to a fund. Y'all build the sidewalks whenever we get ready. But that wasn't good enough on the sidewalk deal, so <laughs> we went through a lot more brain damage, but nonetheless. That's we all got wider about. roads because of it. Thank you. All right, anyone else wish to speak on this? I'm assuming that we don't have a, you don't need a, a motion or a direction from us. Have you, no, do you I, have the feedback that you want? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and there'll definitely be lots more opportunity for feedback, both from you all and the public and development task force, home builders, everyone will be included. Um, you know, we don't have too many parties present at meetings, but for us to know when those development task force meetings are happening, um, and then that way, if anyone wanted to attend, we'd be able to. I felt like with the sidewalk situation, we were kind of left in the dark, and there were multiple conversations happening at different meetings, and they were very different conversations um, when I did attend a few of them. So I would request that we be informed when those happen, and it's up to us if we'd like to attend. Sure. Thank you. Uh, okay. That uh, is a great segue into public comment. Issues or concerns on the regular agenda may be raised by the public at this time. Excuse me, not on the regular agenda, may be raised by the public at this time. Citizens should speak from the podium, address all comments to the dais, and start by stating their name and address or single member district. Please limit all remarks to less than three minutes. Anyone, I'm gonna open it up for public comment. Uh, I'm gonna close public comment. The, the only thing I'd like to discuss with, with the staff and John is uh, the, the process of approving um, these subdivision plats with rezoning. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I keep going back in my, in my head to uh, the, the subdivision that, uh, that was presented on Country Club Road. Um, we went through a preliminary plat, I think maybe even a final plat before the zoning came through. And it was the zoning that required the notice of the public and brought an angry mob in. And I, we're all trying to avoid that. So. Uh, I, I feel like if there's a rezoning that needs to be done with land, uh, it would be nice to have it presented with the preliminary plot. And I understand Russell's point that they don't want to invest in, uh, in the plot if the zoning's not going to go through. It's, but to have it all kind of done in one process, to, to, to leave the public in the dark about approving a preliminary plot and then to, for it to be a a surprise for everyone when the zone change comes in is uh, is what I'm really trying to avoid. Sure. So I don't know how we do that going forward, but. Well, and since that time, we have made a change in, in how we treat final plats uh, that would require rezoning. We, we are not bringing those to you with condition that they get rezoned. Um, now, in, unless it's a unique circumstance, um, the rezoning would have to be in place before a plat could come forward to you all. Uh, the preliminary plats might need some further discussion. Um, again, oftentimes, like I said earlier, uh, a developer will plan a, a really large area sure. and preliminary plat out the whole thing. Um, and typically they're not going to go out and rezone. Uh, you know, we have some preliminary plats that are 100, 100 lots, uh, but they develop in 10 or 15 lots phases at a time and they zone each of those as they come in. Um, and I'm not sure we would wanna ask them to come in and rezone all 100 lots when the development of those lots might not be for 10, 15 years out. Uh, so I, I understand, I understand the discussion. balance in that point, uh, but I hope you understand my concern uh, to, number one, to, to understand if there are zoning implications with what the developers propose to do when we're considering a preliminary plot uh, sure. that, that would weigh in my consideration of, of approving a preliminary plot. Um, so I, I think they kind of go hand in hand. Originally. Well, 
It is in the ETJ, but right. that really wasn't, it wasn't the, full, okay. the issue. The issue was the zoning. Yeah. It wasn't zoned. I don't, I don't think, it or was, was there zoning? Well, there was no was, zoning. No, was but there, there was an issue with it being, uh, they annexed, yeah. um, and then with the, the rezoning, part of it. Um, state law does not require notification of folks outside the city limits. Yeah. And so many of the upset homeowners were across the street outside the city, so didn't necessarily get a notice of the rezoning. So that, I mean, that, a minor issue, but that was, was an issue yeah. with that one. Yeah. That one had a number of different issues. <laughs> it was tricky. Uh, okay. Anyone but else have? I, I will say one thing that based yeah. on what you said, at the very least, if we bring you a preliminary plat uh, that does not currently have the, the right zoning, I think we will make sure to point out that I this think that would, would require rezoning to develop the way they've shown it. I think that would help a lot. Uh, okay, director's report. I didn't have anything else to add. And then future meeting agenda and announcements. The next regular meeting of the Planning Commission is scheduled to begin at 9 a.m. on Monday, February 20th at the East Mezzanine of City Hall, 72 West College Avenue, San Angelo, Texas. Adjournment. Do I have a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 4-0, it's 1037.